was walking through the halls of the White House right before receiving the presidential award, I couldn't believe I was there. It was so surreal. And I vividly could hear my mom's voice telling me, close the window. She'll, see, she'll tell me this every time she'll see me staring at the window, watching teens playing outside. Close the window. Those kids are wasting their time. Too much free time leads you to no good. Use your time wisely. I really didn't understand her, but I couldn't argue much with her. On a daily time, I was witnessing my household economic and emotional challenges and how hard my parents were working. And I wanted to help. That became my goal, my number one drive, help my family. Upon high school graduation, the question was, what should I pursue? A passion? A passion will have been a luxury that I couldn't afford. Mechanical engineering sounded like a good opportunity. Living in an industrial city in Mexico, there were plenty of engineering jobs. But there seemed to be one problem. Mechanical engineering seemed to be not for girls. Naively, my mom asked if it was illegal or if it was written somewhere that girls were not allowed. Well, not illegal, not written anywhere, but there are no girls, period. She encouraged me to pursue the path less travel. That was quite an elegant statement. In reality, she said, no seas de la borregada. <laughs> so kind of pushed into it, I signed in. And yes, I was the only girl, not just in my class, but in the whole mechanical engineering program. In December 1993, I graduated. The time that I had been waiting for had arrived. I could now provide for my family. Let's look for a job. All the ads in the newspaper in Mexico will read like this one. Mechanical engineer needed. Sex, nail. That's a huge problem. That's a big problem for me. So, mechanical engineering was a mistake. Mechanical engineering was not for girls. What to do now? I had three options. The first one, cry. The second one, start a campaign to give female engineers a chance. Well, it was hard to start a campaign to give female engineers a chance because there were not too many female engineers that could have joined the movement. The third one got deeper into the mistake. Close the window, focus, and continue with my education. I was brave, I was blessed, and I was brave too, to jump into an opportunity to pursue graduate school at Rice University. My graduate school years were extremely hard, emotionally, physically, and mentally hard. And many times I felt like giving up that I couldn't continue. But I couldn't. I had been already rejected as an engineer, so I couldn't give up. Despite whatever, I had to finish. I had no options. So finally, in 1999, May 1999, I graduated. The day after commencement, this picture made front page of the newspaper. <laughs> That day, I realized that I was the first Mexican woman to graduate from Rice University in the history of Rice University. I decided then that my goal now was not just to provide for my family, but to inspire others to pursue the path less travel, to empower and prepare students to jump into opportunities. In January 2000, I became a professor, a mechanical engineering professor at a university with an expertise in nanotechnology, specifically nanofibers. I'm sure many of you have heard about nanotechnology. 
I'm sure you've heard about nanofibers. <laughs> but do you know what nanotechnology can do for you? How about nanofibers? How can you use nanofibers? Okay, imagine, just imagine making paper-thin batteries with very little waste. Imagine making or healing complex diabetic wounds or burnt wounds in a matter of weeks. Studies have shown that all of this is possible with nanofibers, that you can actually heal the wounds in a matter of weeks. But how? What are nanofibers? Nanofibers are like your hair, but thousand times smaller. You can actually fit over 600,000 nanofibers in one hair, over half a million nanofibers in one of your hairs. They're so small that you cannot see them bare eye. You need very specialized microscopes to see them. Nanofibers are known for having high surface area and high porosity. What is surface area? Let's imagine we have this bucket of paint. In this bucket of paint, we have, let's say, 100 million atoms or blue paint. For certain applications where we, we have to store charge, for example, in this one, charge is stored only on the surface. The rest of the paint is basically being west, wasted. It's not storing any charge. What will happen if we now paint a wall with this paint? Well, now we have much higher surface area where we can store the charge. We have a lot more charge in the same 100 million atoms. This layer of paint is about 100 microns, usually the paint that you see on any wall. 100 microns is 100,000 nanometers. With that 100 microns, we can make millions of nanofibers. And around each nanofiber, we can store charge. So you understand now uh, surface area, right? <laughs> I'm going to give you a quiz. <laughs> so now, how about porosity? Let's understand porosity a little bit. So in this side, let's say we have some hairs. And in between each one of the hairs, in these empty spaces, we have some pores. We have 14 pores in there. Okay? What happens if those hairs, we make them into nanofibers? We'll have millions, right? So now we have a lot more holes. We have much higher porosity. It's the perfect scaffold for biological applications. The scaffold that we were seeing there has a lot of pores and cells, bone cells, skin cells, cardiac cells, love that platform to grow. But how? How is it that they do it? How, why is it the cell is going to want to anchor and grow in that particular uh, membrane? Just picture yourself going through a monkey bars. Okay? If the bar on the monkey bars is too wide, you're not going to be able to move through it. You're just basically going to fall down. It's too wide. You can't grab it. You fall down. So what happened? If now you go to another monkey bar where the bar is the right size, you're going to be able to go through the monkey bars, just like in here. Of course, if you have enough, enough strength, otherwise you're just going to stay in the middle and maybe fall down. But that's not the fault of the monkey bars. Okay? <laughs> so um, this particular platform is basically the one that we need to heal the wounds. The cells anchor to each one of those nanofibers because they have the right size. So they anchor to it, and then they, grow, they reproduce and they populate the area. It gives them a place to hold on to it. And that's what the cells need. That's what they, they're called scaffolds for the cells, okay? exactly like the monkey bars. So in the future, in the very near future, we're just going to spray you with these nanofibers just exactly as a, what is it? Like a well-known superhero can do, <laughs> right? We can spray you with those nanofibers, like silk nanofibers, put it on your skin, the cells are going to populate it and heal the wound in a matter of weeks. Okay? <laughs> However, 
there was a problem, a small problem. The existing methods, the existing production methods to make nanofibers produce very, very tiny amounts with too many constraints. So all of these promising applications were that, promising applications, a lab curiosity. In my case, working mainly with undergraduate students, I am always looking for projects where I could ignite that spark for the students to fall in love with research, to try to do something to innovate. So this project about making nanofibers wasn't really working. The students were, they had to spend a lot of time in the lab with very little results. We couldn't really do much with it, so um, we started looking for a project that could produce nanofibers quickly in a cost-effective and environmentally friendly way. Wearing my you know, mother hat or my engineering hat and my mother hat, whatever I go, I took my sons to watch Elmo and his friends to the arena. What do they sell at the arena? When you go to the circus, what do you say, what do you, what they find? Cotton candy, exactly, okay? Cotton candy. So as soon as I got the cotton candy into my hands, I couldn't believe it. Fibers, 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 and tons of fibers. It was amazing. It was basically the solution to our problems. I look at it, and my mind just went crazy, totally crazy. Poor little ones. I had to leave the arena that same moment. <laughs> Poor little ones, I had to leave the arena at that same moment. I told them, sorry guys, we had to go. We have to avoid the rush, the traffic, we have to go. And it was kind of in the middle of the show. But uh, <laughs> we left the arena, ran to the toy store, bought a lot of car candy toy machines, went to my lab, showed it to my students, and together we engineered a way to make the big cotton fibers into nanofibers using only centrifugal force. Innovation can certainly happen anywhere to those that are prepared. If I didn't have the problem of the nanofibers and I knew nothing about nanofibers, I could have just enjoyed the current candy <laughs> and regret it later because of the extra pounds, <laughs> right? So in 2009, we co-founded a company. I was named Chief Technology Officer of the company. Let's go back for a second to this slide. In this slide, I found out that I had a problem. And what is that I did? I closed the window, I focused, and this is the result. The company sold equipment all over the world and received very prestigious awards, such as the R&D 100 in 2011, given to the top 100 technologies in the world. All of this for a once 10-year-old girl with a dream to help her family. <laughs> and later on, her students. This girl that was rejected as an engineer received at 27 years old the most prestigious award given to any young scientist in the United States, the Career Award. <laughs> this girl has now many patents in the US, Russia, Europe, China, Japan. This girl has empowered and prepared hundreds of students to jump into opportunities that are now giving them, giving them the opportunity to provide for their families. This girl has been invited to the White House not once, but twice, and only because her engineering passion. Mechanical engineering was not a mistake.
throughout this adventure, I have learned a lot of important lessons. I'm going to share with you three of those. The first one, labels can make you small if you allow it. In Mexico, I was a double minority. Hispanic, sorry. I was a double minority, female and an engineer. In the United States, I became a triple minority, Hispanic, female, and an engineer. So you have an option. You either believe those societal labels, act accordingly to the stereotype of that label, and maybe even play the victim role. Or you can use those challenges as a fuel to change your situation. The second one, remove the pursuit your passion thinking. These days, every time we go and talk to the youth, it seems like that's the buzzword. Pursue your passion. Be happy. Do what will make you happy. No, achieving a goal or a dream is not easy. There's nothing wrong with communicating to the youth that achieving a goal or that actually sweat and tears are worth it. They're totally worth it. And the third one, close the windows. If you want to change your situation, your community, your country, the world, just close the window. This is contrary to what you hear on a daily basis. You need to be informed. You need to get out. There's too many distractions. How about looking in for a bit? Close the window. Close the window and you know, windows of your electronics these days. <laughs> Believe me, you're not going to miss anything by staying in the chat, by focusing for certain periods of your time. If you close these windows for certain periods of your time, there's not, nothing's going to happen. But I can assure you that you're, you're going to come out stronger and much better prepared to make an impact. What will happen if you just close the window? Thank you, Mommy, for teaching me to close the window. Thank you. Thank you all.